All right, so um, we're going to start by going over that uh, that last slide um, from from this morning, and we'll talk about the research project. Um, actually, you know, let's talk about the research project first. I already have that stuff all pulled up, and then um, that'll be we'll go over the um, mechanisms uh, afterwards. All right, so the I'm not sure if this has gotten posted yet to our Canvas shell, um, at least to something that you guys can see it. So we'll go through the assignment itself. Um, so this is the, the assignment for the presentation, um, but it, you want to kind of keep this in mind when you're picking your articles. Um, that the the article requirement section is the main thing to be keeping in mind when you're looking for an article. Um, the primary requirement, I guess these are all, all the same level of importance. Um, it has to have something to do with organic chemistry, something that we talked about. It can be talking about NMR, it can be talking about synthesis, it can be talking about reaction conditions, it can be talking about a mechanism or computational stuff. Um, but it has to be related to organic chemistry pretty strongly this time. Now that you guys have enough background in organic chemistry, I don't want you to, um, to just pick something that's only barely related to OCHEM. Um, so biochemistry stuff is still fair game as long as they're talking about organic chemistry topics. Um, so synthesis of pharmaceuticals or mechanisms, even um, enzymes, as long as they're talking about topics we've covered in this um, series. Uh, the article needs to be from a peer-reviewed journal. I've got a couple good um, databases that you can look for. Um, and if you find a good article, I can find a way to get you access to that article. So don't be worried when you hit a paywall. Um, some of them we have access to already. Some of them I get limited amount, uh, number of articles a year that I can uh, use to get you access. And then we have some other, some other resources that we can find ways to get articles um, through various means <clears throat> um, for, uh, for things like nature. Um, that we don't have have institution wide access for, but it does need to be a peer reviewed journal. Um, so not not an article talking about peer reviewed journal and the peer reviewed journal itself primary research, meaning you're not looking for analysis of somebody else's research. Um, those can be that can be a good place to get started. When you're looking for um, for something, so anything that's published in you know New York Times that's talking about somebody's primary research, New York Times is not peer reviewed article. Scientific American is not a peer reviewed article. They frequently will be referencing peer reviewed articles, so you can use the ones that they're referencing, but that's you're not presenting on somebody else's analysis. Then the last is the article should not be a review article. A review article is generally um, a sort of current affairs, current state of, of a particular area of scientific research. Um, they tend to be really long. They tend to have multiple authors and tons and tons of citations. Um, they might, and tons and tons of uh, sources, they might have 150 different articles that they cite in a review article, um, but it's, if it's a review article, they're not doing the research themselves. They're just sort of accumulating everybody else's research and putting it into a form that um, you could use to sort of get yourself caught up on the current state of tech of um, of a certain area. Um, and these these will generally have the word review in the title or in one of the keywords, um, and definitely in the abstract. If it looks like all they're doing is is reading other people's um, research and putting it together, that's a review article. That's not what we're looking for. Um, for one, because they're too long. A lot of review articles can get up into the 20, 30, 40, 50 pages range um, because they're trying to tell you everything that's happened in the last five years. Um, so if you 
find one of those and you're interested in it and you wanted to do that as your article, um, then I'm, I'm going to look at that and say, well, this is a good start, but you need to look at one of the things that that review article cites as a source. So a lot of times you're going to want to sort of crawl through the citations, find something that's kind of related to what you're looking for. And then if they say one really interesting sentence in there and give it a source, you go find that source and read that article or at least the abstract. Um, so it's not going to be the first four things that you find when you Google a keyword in one of these databases, at least probably not. And so then the we won't worry about the presentation requirements at this point. The four articles that you're looking for, try to pick articles that meet these three criteria. And when you submit them, if one of if some of them don't meet that criteria, um, then I'm going to tell you either can't use that one or use that as a stepping point to get to an article that's more suitable. Um, keep, things to keep in mind is that because we're not talking about a review article, these are going to be very, very narrow in focus. Um, so you, you're not going to find an article that tells you everything about organic solar cells, for instance. That would be a review article or even a textbook. What you might find is a review article that says, we looked at using this one very specific polymer as a cheap solar cell, and we found this was our increase in efficiency. Um, so again, very, very narrow. They'd be talking about one polymer, maybe three or four polymers, or maybe three or four molecules are looking at, um, but not something that'll give you an overview of the entire field of study. Um, generally speaking, in terms of the page limits on these, if you if you get an article that meets these criteria, it's probably going to be in the five to ten pages range, including citations. Some might be a little bit shorter, some might be a little bit longer, but probably not much. You get something that's longer than ten pages, it's probably not an appropriate article. All right, what else looking at here? Um, yes, I would not recommend do, using Sci-Hub either. It'd be terrible if you got free access to a bunch of PDF articles that are behind paywalls in other places. Um, Sci-Hub is sort of a place for, um, it's a place people post PDFs and access to articles that they publish themselves to get around paywalls that way. Um, so it's it's a little bit like a file sharing um, website. Um, Although I think that that's gotten cracked down on in recent years, so it's a little bit harder, but a lot of journals will have open access versions or they'll have open access articles that you can get to for free. And then they'll have the, the ones that are behind the paywall are gonna be the ones that, are, that tend to be more technical or, um, but all that is still changing on a almost daily basis, it seems as copyright lawsuits get filed and things like that. So um, we'll see how that'll works for, for now, what you guys can use, um, so I'm. this is the assignment that has some instructions on it that you guys are actually gonna submit your four articles. Um, and the way I want you to submit them is basically just as a Word doc um, with a, for each of your four articles, I wanna see the article title and the journal where it was published, um, the abstract, if it has an abstract, um, what concepts from class are you think are relevant to, the, to that article and then a couple sentences about why you're interested in this one um some old the reason i said uh if it has an abstract is some older articles don't have um don't have an abstract specifically because that was something that kind of came about um a little bit after I want to say probably the 80s, um, and not all of them. Some some of the earlier articles um, will be won't be digitized fully, so they don't have the abstract pulled out. So what they'll do instead is they'll show you um, an image of the first page of the article um, if they don't have a digital typed out abstract. Um, and 
And the reason I mention this is because um, old articles are not necessarily bad. A lot of times there, there are classic articles out there that talk about things that we're studying in class that may not be relevant to current events, but might be um, interesting to you. Maybe you, you wanted to go read um, you know, a Nobel Prize winning um, article. For instance, there's a, there's a guy from UC Santa Barbara, um, I think his name is Heger, um, who was, was the first person to, to publish anything about organic semiconductors using, using carbon-based molecules as semiconductors, which sort of laid the road, ground road for a lot of nanotech and a lot of um, organic photovoltaics, um, organic, um, organic LEDs. Um, so if you wanted to read some of, you know, a seminal article on something that won somebody a Nobel Prize, um, that article might be 50 years old. Doesn't mean it's a bad article. You're still going to have to do a lot of analysis of it. Um, so those are, those are fair game as well. Just because something is old doesn't mean it's off limits or that it's not worth looking at. Um, let's see. So here are some of the most relevant databases. Um, nature and science are tend to be very broad, and they're going to have a lot of. They're sort of the the cream of the crop as far as a groundbreaking paper in any scientific discipline could get published in Science or Nature. Um, science and Nature are not limited to only one field of study, so you get a lot of of really well-written articles because they're very, very selective. Um, so the articles tend to be well-written well and written for a broad audience, meaning it probably would be a little bit easier to follow, um, but there are gonna be a lot of topics on in nature and in science that aren't related to organic chemistry. Um, you know, astronomy, physics, the Higgs boson, that stuff's all super cool, but that's not relevant to OCHEM. So you might have to dig a little bit more Everything might seem interesting, but you got to pick through it to find something that's relevant enough to what we're studying. Um, on the flip side, Journal of the American Chemical Society, which is abbreviated JAX, um, is a very, the American Chemical Society is a very good, um, well-regarded journal in chemistry in general. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, JAX is sort of the top tier chemistry journal. So it's like one step below nature is JAX um, because and it is more, um, more focused on, on chemistry. So for instance, um, highly stable one, two dicarbonyl radical cations derived from N heterocyclic carbenes. Right off the bat, that actually is something very related to OCHEM, right? Um, you might not know what all those words mean necessarily. Uh, you probably should know what most of those mean. Um, so this is going to be a lot easier to find something that's relevant, although it might not be as groundbreaking or as, as wide, wide ranged as you might be hoping for. Um, and the other thing about the ACS is that they've got a list of a whole bunch of different journal articles that fit under the umbrella of the American Chemical Society. Um, so you can see things like you can browse all subject areas. So organic chemistry. And then within organic chemistry, you can see, oh, maybe I'm interested in synthesis. And then you can just click, you know, see all organic synthesis reactions. And it's going to be 5,000 papers. Um, and then, but and then you can narrow it down by putting in some keywords or just seeing, seeing, um, you know, sort by. Um, instead of sorting by relevance, you could sort by newest or oldest or et cetera, or refine things over on the side. Um, so there's a ton of articles in the ACS family. Um, you know, medicinal chemistry, that's probably going to be fairly related to OCHEM in some way. You know, there's going to be a lot of articles in there that are related both to medicine and organic chemistry, right? Um, so I would. I wouldn't just go with nature or science necessarily. You might wind up picking things from nature and science, but it'd be kind of to get an idea of what keywords you're interested in or what journals are out there that sound interesting to you. 
um, I'd spend some time browsing around this as well, just to see what's what's out there. Um, so if you're interested in materials science, accounts of materials research, and current issue, they've got fluorinated copolymers, current status and future perspectives. That sounds like a review article, but not necessarily. Um, CO2 reduction using electrocatalysts at high current densities. This is talking about turning CO, fixing CO2 and turning it into something that could be used as a fuel source potentially. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in these articles. And then um, nature, you guys don't have direct access to, um, but you will be, some of the nature articles are open source. Um, and the ones that aren't, I can get you access to a PDF if need be, just, um, just let me know. Uh, I just only have a, a certain fixed number of those I can call in at any given time. So um, you don't need to read the whole article to submit it for this assignment. And then we'll talk about which ones are more relevant and which ones you need access to to read if you're gonna choose one of them. And then last, um, I'm not sure how this is working from um, off campus, but um, from LTCC does have access to science at this point. It looks like they fixed all the links and everything. Um, so it'll ask you to log in to give you access, and then you you should have access to all of the articles in science. Um, and some of these are going to be not none of these are specific to organic chemistry necessarily, um, but some of those other article or journals in there might be interesting too. Um, and you might just look at current table of contents, see what articles in there. Um, opening path to biotech this week and other journals, new products, news at a glance. Um, and these, like you said, these read more like newspaper headlines because they're going to be very broad. They're not, they're going to be written for all types of scientists. Um, so lots of options in here, and we have access to all of these. And this might be one where you need to use the search box um, because it's so broad, um, save to search for organic chemistry or pick a topic that's interesting to you, synthesis or something like that. Uh, ideal synthesis, total synthesis. Basal diamond synthesis from lower di diamondoids. Well, diamonds are made out of carbon. Um, so this might be more material science focused, but it's not necessarily out of the realm of what might be, you might uh, be interesting, interested in, and it could you could relate it back to organic chemistry. Um, lots of biology, biosynthesis stuff. Here's one, atomically precise bottom-up synthesis of pi extended five trianguline. That sounds very organic, even if I don't know what trianguline is, right? Um, this is looking at graphene molecules. So this is gonna be also related to biotech, or sorry, nanotech and um, material science as well. And trying to build and synthesize specific, so trianguline must be the, must be, um, these fused benzene rings of various sizes. All right, so lots of good options, lots of good resources for you to look through. Um, like I said, if nothing else, reading through the table of contents or sort of reading some of the abstracts that are in nature and science is sort of a good idea to see what's hot right now in science in general, um, even if it's not something that you could pick for this particular project. All right, any questions so far on the uh, on this assignment? Um, I didn't mention it in here because this is a little bit trickier to make sure you get a good peer-reviewed journal article. Um, and you might have to dig through several layers of citations, but Wikipedia is not actually a bad place to start. If you just start from the Wikipedia page for, say, organic LEDs and start from the Wikipedia article, 
um, you know, down at the bottom, find your sources and there's going to be, you know, here you go, further reading. Some of these are going to be textbooks. Some of these are going to be, um, you know, news articles, but some of them, look, this is published in advanced functional materials. That sounds a lot like a peer reviewed journal article, right? So you might have to check the, some of these links to see about it, but um, if you're selective, Wikipedia is not a bad place to start if you have a topic in mind and you don't know where to start with some of the bigger journals or databases. Um, you could start here and because typically these further reading sections are going to be pretty, um, they're going to use articles that are either review articles um, or are going to be pretty groundbreaking fundamental um, research sort of articles. Yeah, these these are all going to be. If it says a survey, that's either a textbook or a review article, um, so not necessarily what you're looking for. Anything with an ISBN is going to be a textbook or a. Um, it's not not going to be a an article we want to use for this, but anything that you have a DOI number. Um, DOI numbers are listed for academic papers. So if you see a source that has a DOI number, that's also a good indicator that that might be a, a um, source that you could use. And look at that, it comes up with advanced functional materials with a whole bunch of art articles and yeah, none, it doesn't even say review. So for instance, if you were into organic LEDs and you wanted to look at this, I just found you a good article um, just by randomly choosing a topic. Um, you can also do the same thing looking for specific authors. If there's a particular author that you're interested in, um, you guys might not know um, specific scientists that are researching your things, but if you notice somebody at UNR that's studying a topic that you're interested in, um, finding an individual professor, and a lot of times they will have links to some of their greatest hits, sort of, so to speak. Um, so for instance, that guy Heger from, from UCSB, um, I think his name is Heger. Yeah, Alan Heger, he has, even has his own Wikipedia page. That's how you know he's a big deal in the science community. If you get your own Wikipedia page. Um, uh, and that's not a great one because he's not actually on um, because he's not a current researcher. But if you just look at, say, the chemistry department at UNR, um, explore faculty by research areas. And it's going to have a list of all, all their faculty and what they're studying. Um, so uh, Anna Betancourt is studying fullerenes, so conjugated um, graphene wrapped into a circle, buckyballs, um, you know, so research interests, stuff like this. So this is not a bad way to do it too, especially if you're floundering, don't really know where to start. Look at what schools you're, look, you're interested in going to and find who's doing research in the biology or in the chemistry departments or material science department and find the research interest that's interesting to you. Um, not necessarily going to use all of those things that you find, but it's still a good practice for how to how to determine whether um, you're interested in working in a particular department or you know what's going on locally in terms of research. So I have been uh, this actually I. I would have been very interested in this when I was in grad school because I looked at thio thiophene based polymers for organic LEDs, which appears that's also what she's looking at. Um, and then from here, you're going to have Journal of Luminescence, you're going to have all your, your data that you can then use to turn around and, and find this article in one of those databases. Or just Google the title, and usually it'll take you to a source. And so lots of different ways to get to these papers. 
Um, hopefully, at least one of those methods seemed interesting to you. If you really have no idea where to start, I would start by reading through Nature or Science's current articles and see what's going on and see what strikes your fancy or start browsing through the ACS um, associated journals to see what's interesting to you. All right, so that's all I have on, um, on this assignment. Any questions? Um, if you've got the time today, you could probably probably find four articles by the end um, and get this written and turned in by the end of lab today. But if you'd rather use the time to study for the test, I'd understand that too. Um, so I'm not going to require you to get this turned in before you leave today. Um, but as long as I'm here, I can be giving you feedback on stuff while we're while we're here too. So. All right, then with that in mind, let me pull up the slides, the last slide that we went, we're going through. And we can practice drawing some of these mechanisms, right? And so, I'm actually going to stop screen sharing as long as you have these reactions written down so I can do the uh, mechanism on the board here. There we go. My video might be catching up. All right, so a reminder, what we're looking at is we're trying to make sure we're picking the right mechanism based on whether it's in acidic or basic conditions. And so, and the reaction itself will give us, um, will give us information about that. If we're in basic conditions, then our then our reactant will be the deprotonated form of a nucleophile. If we're in acidic conditions, then our reactant will be the protonated form. And it may explicitly say um, in acidic conditions or in basic conditions. All right, so for A, if we're looking at the reactants, um, we can see by the fact that we are looking at the deprotonated form of acetate or of, sorry, propanoate that we're under basic conditions. So with that in mind, uh, let me get this set up to minimize the glare and So you guys can see what's going on. So here is our propanoyl fluoride. And then we have the propano propanoic anhydride, or sorry, no, that's gonna be our product. Um, our propanoate as our nucleophile. So in acidic, or sorry, in basic conditions, we want to avoid making anything positively charged. So we're not going to protonate here. Negative charges are okay. No positive charges if it's basic, if you can avoid it by doing a proton transfer anyway. So our first step of our mechanism would just look like our carboxylate attacking the carbonyl carbon, carbonyl bond breaks to make room for it. And we're gonna make that tetrahedral intermediate. So 
So we get an intermediate that looks like this. We have a negative charge and that's okay because we're not in acidic conditions. We're in basic conditions. So making something that's basic is okay. Second step is going to be, um, we don't need to do any proton transfers here because one, there aren't any protons around really. Um, and by having our leaving group leave, we can reform our carbonyl and we're not making anything that's uh, acidic or positively charged by doing this. So this is a valid step under basic conditions. So our final product then is going to be the propanoic anhydride and chloride. All right, so in basic conditions, it tends to be simpler because when we're dealing with these reactions, um, our nucleophiles are bases, generally speaking. So if, we, if we're under basic conditions, that means we don't have to deprotonate our nucleophile before it can attack or to protonate the carbonyl before it can break. So these are typically going to be faster, simpler mechanisms under basic conditions. Problem is, the problem in terms of, of uh, why would we ever do it in, in acidic conditions is, well, acidic conditions are a lot more common in nature. And two, you get better yields doing this these reactions under acidic conditions, despite the fact there are more steps along the way. Under acidic conditions, like in B, um, plus NH3, we're trying to get to the amide. And so our first step, we would normally want our amine to attack the carbonyl and break the carbonyl bond here, right? But that would be making a negative charge on that oxygen. And if we're under acidic conditions, we can't do that. So our first step has to be our carbonyl oxygen grabs a proton, that gets protonated. Now, instead of making something with a negative charge, when we break that, we go from a positive charge to neutral, which is allowed in, um, in these neck under acidic conditions. So then the next step would be our nucleophile can come in and the carbonyl bond can break. <coughs> Excuse me. And now we have an NH3 with that nitrogen is going to have a positive charge because we have a nitrogen with four bonds. Again, positive charges are allowed, negative charges aren't. So then we have to think about the next step to try and get to the amide is we need to reform that carbonyl bond and kick off a leaving group. Chlorine is a good enough leaving group. We don't need to protonate this before it can leave, even in acidic conditions. Even in acidic conditions, this chloride is stable enough. It's a weak enough base that you can kick a chloride off 
even under acidic conditions. So you don't need to do another proton transfer step here. And that's going to be about the only leaving group that's a strong enough, um, that's a good enough leaving group that you don't need to protonate it before it can leave. And for all of the rest of them, maybe a carboxylate leaving group. If you have the acid anhydride, that the carboxylate might be a good enough leaving group that you could avoid protonating it. Um, but for water as a leaving group, for an um, for an ester breaking apart, for an amide or a uh, nitrogen as a leaving group, you're always going to need to have it protonated before it can leave. So in this case, we can then remake our carbonyl bond, chlorine can leave. Sorry, Sean, are you missing a methyl on that, that diagram right there? Yes, I am, thank you. No worries. All right, so then after we do that, if we reform our, our pi bond, We still have a protonated carbonyl and a protonated nitrogen. So we're still not totally done because we need to do, we need to get rid of the extra protons on the oxygen and on the nitrogen to get back to the neutral state. But that can be drawn it's more or less as one as one step. Uh, let's see, I'll draw it. So nitrogen kicks the hydrogen off, a proton off and keeps the electrons. Same thing happens here. So one last or two last protons transfer steps. to get us to our final product. And so again, knowing where you're trying to go is really helpful as far as remembering that I need to do these last two pro, um, proton transfer steps and, and making sure that when you kick your leaving group off, you're not kicking off the group that you actually want to stay on there to get to your product, that you're not just going backwards by kicking off the same nucleophile that just attacked. Right, those are things that can happen, but there's no point in drawing them if that's just if it's not taking us closer to where we want to go. All right, questions so far. When in doubt, if you're in acidic conditions, add proton transfer step. It, um, you know, the, the only time it's not appropriate to do the proton transfer step is when you've got a leaving group like chlorine. Um, other than that, you're almost always gonna be adding a proton transfer step every step of the way through this, through this mechanism. So if we're trying to make an ester out of vinegar and methanol, and we're in acidic conditions, if you're in acidic conditions, the first step is always going to be to protonate that carbonyl because you can't, you can't break this pi bond and be left with a negative charge here if you're in acidic conditions. 
So you have to protonate it first. Then your methanol can act as a nucleophile. And you can break that pi bond. And you're going to wind up actually with what looks to be a fairly stable intermediate where everything's neutral almost. You get. a diol with a methanol attached to it. And so from here, remember we're trying to get to the ester. So we want to kick off one of these OH groups, but we can't do it just as a hydroxide because we're in acidic conditions. We can't make hydroxide as a product. So we have to protonate it first. And frankly, at, at this point, it doesn't matter which of these oxygens we protonate. They're equivalent, right? We can't tell the difference between these. In fact, that's actually one of the ways they proved that this mechanism was the right mechanism is that they did this reaction in acidic conditions where they started with an acetic acid molecule where one of the oxygens was oxygen 18 and the other oxygen was oxygen 16. And what they found was that in the product, um, you had a 50-50 chance of having oxygen 16 or 18 in your final product. So there was equal probability that you kicked off either of the two oxygens. So if we're going to protonate here, pick one of your, ox your OH groups and protonate it. Um, if you wanted to, you could show, you could uh, kick off the proton from your methanol at this point as well, or you could wait to the end to do that. Doesn't really make a difference. So after our proton transfer, we wind up with this intermediate. And for the sake of keeping things simple at this point, if we said that it went through the other proton transfer at the same time, our intermediate would look like this. Now we can have our leaving group leave and our OH group can donate pair of electrons to reform the carbonyl. So we wind up losing the water and making protonated methyl acetate. So then the last step would be kick off that last proton to get us back to our fully neutral product. So the trick with the, with these is one, knowing where you're going, knowing that you have to do two primary steps. And that is nucleophile attacks and then leaving group leaves and you add whatever proton transfer steps, if you're in acidic conditions, you add whatever proton transfer steps you need along the way that gets you to the right product. 
right? If we're in acidic conditions, the reason we we want to work in acidic conditions is because there's lots of protons. If there's lots of protons, we have a lot of freedom when writing these mechanisms to protonate whatever leaving groups we need to. So last step would just be like that. gives us our methyl acetate. One more time, I'll say it just because, like I said, I remember being confused by this mechanism um, when I learned it the first time. If it's acidic conditions, you only want things that are either neutral or positively charged. If it's in basic conditions, you don't want any positive charges. You want everything to have a negative charge. And the one exception to the everything has to have a positive charge or neutral in acidic conditions is if chloride is your leaving group. Chloride or a carboxylate. If they're stable enough on their own as a leaving group, they don't need to be positively charged in, in acidic conditions. Um, so just keep that in mind when doing these. And you should be, you should be okay. Any questions on these mechanisms? I don't know if this is random, but I was curious about with like Grignard reagents and I mean, I know it's not the exact same, but do you have to use a solvent that has no protons at all? Because I remember we talked about water, but I'm wondering, would it do the same thing with alcohols and stuff? Yes. So Grignard reagents, you, you need to do, they need to react in a, um, polar aprotic solvent. So if it has, the, if it's anything that is even mildly acidic, a Grignard reagent will react with it. Um, and we will see that'll be one of the first reactions we add when we come back after after the midterm will be if you expose this to a Grignard reagent, you basically are going to get the same product as if you exposed an aldehyde to a Grignard reagent. You have because it's a good nucleophile. You just wind up adding it here and kicking off a leaving group. Gotcha. Um, and so, yeah, they, they do play a role and we do need to pay attention to that. And that's why we have that category of solvents that we specifically call them out as being aprotic. An aprotic solvent is necessary um, for a lot of these reactions to happen. So acetone, DMF, um, DMSO, trying to think of what are some other, other common aprotic solvents, uh, dichloromethane. Um, and that's why some of our reactions get specific about what solvent you're using so that you don't get these other side reactions happening. So it's absolutely something to be paying attention to. All right, anything, anything else at this point? All right, well then I'll let you either sign off if you want to, or keep studying, work on the practice test, um, uh, work on finding research articles, whatever you think would be the best use of your time at this point. And I'll be here um, other than around three, I'll need to leave for a few minutes to pick up my son from the bus stop. But other than that, I'll be here till four if you guys are here working. All right, have at it.